All right, uh, this video is a demonstration on how to calculate a forecast for a company. I've got the balance sheet here. I've got the statement of cash flows to the right. Down below, I've got this statement of income. And then I've got the assumptions for our forecast uh, right here. And a key item in the forecast is a sales growth rate. So I'm going to name this cell up here, growth. And I'm going to use that a lot during my calculation, so I we could just uh, name that once and, and reference it uh, throughout. So what I'm going to do here is grow the operating accounts uh, by the sales growth rate. I'm going to start here with sales. I'm going to also pull that down to give me my cost of goods sold and then my gross profit. Selling gen general and administrative expenses will also grow by the same rate as sales. Depreciation expense, if you look over here, is a percent of net fixed assets. So in this case it's 7%. So I'll go up to net fixed assets for this year. Notice that it's empty right now, but we'll add something in there later. Multiplied by the depreciation rate. So what I have is the 0.077% here multiplied by the net fixed assets. My operating income then is my gross profit minus the selling general administrative expenses, minus the depreciation expense. Again, that's going to change when we go up to the balance sheet. My interest income is equal to, in this case, we're going to make it negative because it counts as, as, as in an expense category here. So we don't, when we deduct these amounts from operating income, we want this to be negative so it actually adds to the operating income. So my interest income is equal to my interest rate on short-term investments multiplied by the amount of short-term investments. And again, I need to make that negative. So it's nothing for now because we haven't put that in the balance sheet yet, but it'll show up when we put it in the balance sheet. Next one is one I get a lot of questions about. Um, in this case, the, com the company has two forms of debt, uh, interest-bearing debt, notes payable, and long-term debt. And if you see over here under the assumptions, we have an interest rate for both of those. So here I want to take my interest rate on, on notes payable and multiply that by the amount of notes payable for this year. Again, that's going to be zero for now because we don't have an amount in there. But as we add those amounts, that'll be reflected in the income statement. And then I'm going to take the interest rate on long-term debt and multiply that by the amount of long-term debt. Then my earnings before taxes are equal to the operating income minus the interest ex income, uh, the sum of the interest income and interest expense. My income tax expense is the percentage of my earnings before taxes. So this is equal to my effective tax rate over here of 26% multiplied by my earnings before taxes and then my net income is equal to earnings before taxes minus the income tax expense my dividend paid my dividends paid is equal to the payout ratio multiplied by net income and my addition to retained earnings is equal to my net income minus dividends paid so that takes me through the income statement for now. As I add in information in uh, up in the balance sheet, that's going to affect the depreciation expense, the interest income, and the interest expense, and, and eventually my bottom line. So I can start off with retained earnings. I'm going to set this equal to last year's retained earnings plus the additional retaining earnings for this year. And then I can go to the top here. 
on my cache. I don't have any assumptions down here for cache. So I'm going to expect that this is the cache that they need to generate sales. We see that uh, over the years this grows gradually with the amount of sales. So I'm going to assume that it's also going to grow with sales. So I'm going to set this equal to last year's level of cash multiplied by 1 plus the growth rate. Okay. Short term investments, I have an assumption down here that that's going to remain the same for 2013. So it's going to stay at 905. The accounts receivable, I also expect to grow with sales. Um, if it doesn't, then we're assuming that it um, that the day's sales outstanding is also changing. We're not going to make that assumption right now that the company wants to do that. We're just going to s say that it's going to stay the same. The day's sales outstanding is going to stay the same from one year to the next. Okay. And the same thing with inventory. We're going to assume that the inventory uh, conversion days uh, is also staying the same from one year to the next. So we're going to grow that with sales. Okay. So take the sum of that to get my current assets. My net fixed assets, we expect to grow at the same rate of sales, and that's pretty normal. A company needs to grow its net fixed assets if it expects to increase its revenues. So now below we've got a number for depreciation expense because we filled in that cell. Our depreciation expense for the year is $3,748.96. So the accumulated depreciation for this year for 2013 would be last year's accumulated depreciation plus depreciation expense for this year. We're assuming that the company's not selling off any um, off any of its fixed assets. If it were, that that would affect that, those accounts, but or it would, that would affect accumulated depreciation and net fixed assets, but we're not making that assumption right now. The gross fixed assets then would be equal to the amount of accumulated depreciation plus the amount of net fixed assets. And then the intangible assets for the year, we have an assumption below that say they're going to say the same. Actually, we don't have an assumption down below, but they're going to say the same from year to year, and they, and they usually do. So our total assets are going to be equal to the sum of the current assets, the net fixed assets. Don't include gross fixed assets and accumulated depreciation there because they're, that would be double counting those. And then uh, the intangible assets. So we have total assets of 86, 964. Our accounts payable and accrued expenses are referred to as spontaneously generated liabilities. They are operating accounts. They increase with sales. Again, we're going to assume that our payables deferral period is going to stay the same from one year to the next. So we're just going to grow those with sales. Our accrued expenses is the same thing. We're growing those with sales. And then our notes payable down below, it says our notes payable we're maintaining at 1185.75 for the year. So our total current liabilities are equal to 408.697. Our long-term debt we're going to come back to, that's going to be how we balance our balance sheet. The company's decided that any financing needs that they have uh, will be paid for by uh, or be financed through taking out long-term debt. So our, long, our total liabilities are equal to our current liabilities plus our long-term debt. Pretty low right now because we're going to have to come back through and add in the long-term debt um, here in a few minutes. Common stock is going to stay the same from one year to the next. That only changes if the company issues new equity, which is fairly unlikely for a company to do, or retires existing equity, which does happen sometimes. Uh, they'll, they'll repurchase some equity. Instead of putting it into treasury stock, they'll just retire the shares. Again, um, paid in capital in excess of par. The only things that would change that would be um, issuing new equity again, which is unlikely for a firm to do, or to retire, uh, repurchase and retire equity. We're not going to make the assumption that they're going to do that this year. Uh, that gives us total equity equal to 59,437.12. And so uh, at this point, we only have one thing left to do. 
all of our amounts down here are filled in. We've got interest income of 2082. We've got interest expense of 4980, which is much less than the uh, previous year's interest expense, and that's because we haven't included our um, long-term debt yet. When we do that, just to give you an example here, uh, I'm going to take, I call it additional funds needed. It doesn't fit your text de definition of this, but I'm, I'm looking at the difference between total assets and total li liabilities and owner's equity. So right now I see I've got my difference between the two of 23,444.55. If I just plug this in, 23,444.55, it doesn't balance. And the reason why it doesn't balance is because by adding that, we in increase our interest expense, which then decreases our addition to retained earnings, which creates a greater financing need and that's referred to as a financing feedback. So how do I solve that? I'm going to delete this number for long-term debt. There's two options in, um, in Excel, and this is for most versions of Excel right now. We can use Solver, or we can use Goal Seek. I'll demonstrate each of them. Goal Seek, I want to set, so I clicked on Goal Seek, set cell, cell here that says we want to balance this. Uh, to zero. In other words, I want my total assets and total liabilities and owner's equity to be the same. By changing the long-term debt cell, click OK, and it gives me 24073.03. And that balances everything out. Now, my total assets are equal to my total liabilities plus owner's equity, and everything balances out. Okay. I'm going to undo that now. And I'm going to use Solver. Uh, solver is something that if it isn't added in on your computer or your, on, in, a, in your Excel version, you have to go to the Data Analysis Tool Pack and add that in. So I'm going to set this cell here equal to a value of 0. So that's what's selected here. If it says minimum, you're going to get a really bad answer. You want a value of 0 by changing the amount of long-term debt. And I get the same answer, 24073.73. Okay. So that's the balancing the balance sheet. Now the statement of cash flows. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I demonstrated this in class, and I'll, I'll do 2012 and then 2013, so you can see that as well. We start with net income before preferred dividends, so I'll go to 2012. So that's $44.89.99. Uh, we're going to add back our depreciation expense for the year. And then uh, the increase in accounts receivable. This is a, an increase is a use of cash. So I subtract last year's from this year's and I make it negative. I just want to see the difference. I know that an increase will be a use of cash and I get 275.00. Uh, um, my increase in inventories again it's an asset so an increase is a use of cash and I get 237. Um, accounts payable and accruals or accrued expenses for the second one. Their liabilities, so an increase in those is a is a source of cash, is a source of financing. So I don't want to make these negative. I just find the difference, the increase from one year to the next. Okay. And I just drag that down because the next one below it is uh, uh, the accounts payables and accrued expenses. So my cash flows from operating activities, I just take the sum of these to get 7707.99. The um, a cash acquired to uh, cash used to acquire fixed assets would be equal to the difference, the change in gross fixed assets. Again, because it's an increase, it's going to be a use of cash, so that would be negative. Uh, the reason why we don't use net fixed assets is we've already added back the depreciation up here, so we would be kind of counting that depreciation twice if we use that down below. A uh, short uh, sale of short-term investments. If we look at short-term investments for 2012, we actually increased it, so that's going to be a, a negative 
because it's a use of cash. We used an additional five dollars this year, or in 2012, to um, increase our amount of short-term investments. We don't have any long-term investments, so that's zero. And the cash used for financing activities or investing activities is seven thousand two hundred thirty-five dollars. For the financing activities, we get an increase in notes payable. That's a, a source of cash. So an increase in that would be a positive, an increase, or, or use it, or excuse me, a source of cash. It did increase in 2012 from 2011 levels. So that's $473. Uh, an increase in long-term and current portion of long-term debt. Again, if that increases, that's a, a source of cash. For 2012, it did increase. And then payment of dividends, this comes in the financing side. It's always negative because it's a cash outflow. For 2012, the payment of dividends was equal to $1,968. So our cash provided, and this should actually say by financing activities, is three hundred and thirty point nine nine dollars negative okay. so the net change in cash and cash equivalents is equal to $142. The cash and securities at the beginning of the year were $1803. That's 2011. At the end of the year, I just add the two together. And I should match. So the cash and securities at the end of the year were 1945. 2012 is 1945. So my cash flow statement flows from one year to the next. And to make life easy, I can just grab this, pull it over here. And I'm a dollar. Oh, I'm a dollar off because that just added in there. And so you can see here um, the statement of cash flows balances from year to year. I didn't reference this cell anywhere in my statement of cash flows. So it's accurate. It, it goes through from one year to the next. And I hope that's helpful for your, your assignment and your project.